television studio, huh? Yes. Quite, quite a place. Well, it's a barn, really. I'm sure it's not as glamorous as you thought it'd be. That's right, it isn't. Uh, but things aren't really what they seem to be, are they? My, how observant you are. Welcome to episode 4 of the Columbo podcast, suitable for framing, where things are exactly as they seem. Hi Ian, how are you? Hi Jerry, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. Good. Uh, what's been happening? Been watching a bit of Columbo? Well, as I seem to do most weeks, yes, I've watched an episode of Columbo, which is quite uh, helpful for these podcasts. Yeah, uh, this week it's been, as I said, it's uh, suitable for framing. A uh, episode which is similar in certain regards, but there's a, a slightly different sort of twist at the start. Or a, a yeah, it's it's handled differently. Um, I think we're now past halfway in season one, and mm-hmm. we've not really had a definitive theme emerge. Everything that we've seen has been a little bit different. It's it's like they're trying things out almost. They're still, like I mentioned in previous episodes feeling their way through things a little bit, trying to see what works, what doesn't work. And working, obviously, with the, the actors they have available, trying to make the best of their talents, I mm-hmm. would imagine. But it's a good episode again this week, as far as I'm concerned, so I'm looking forward to having a bit of a chat about it. Good. Will we uh, just crack on, then? Sure. Okay. Um, why don't you give us your weekly summary? Well, I know the folk are very excited about this part of the podcast, so... We get more tweets about your summary than anything else. Oh, I would say it's definitely the top six things that we get tweets about, that's for sure. Carry on. Okay, well this week after a significant change of focus in the third episode, we come back to the sort of general format from the first two episodes. You've got Columbo, you've got a killer, and they're trying to outwit one another. So at that general level, we're back on a steady footing, really. In Suitable for Framing, the killer's called Dale Kingston. He's a well-known art critic, and after his art collector uncle, Rudy Matthews, disinherits him, he resolves to salvage the situation by murdering the old man and framing the new beneficiary, killing two birds with one stone and leaving the valuable art collection in his possession by default. Columbo's challenge, then, is to unravel the deception and identify the true culprit by separating the real evidence from the lies. Fantastic as always, Ian. Thank you. You could get a job as an IMDB summariser. Yeah, I think that's actually on my um, LinkedIn wish list. It should be. Do they have wish lists on LinkedIn? I don't know. No, no, no. I think of something else. I think that's Amazon, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you might edit this out. <laughs> um, so... Where do we start? We start by uh, the view of a a very large grand house. Yeah, well, we we noted in the first uh, couple of episodes that we didn't have any theme tune. We went straight into episode-related noises. And then in episode three, there was music at the start. So that was a departure. And it was, I'm not sure, it wasn't really a theme tune. It was incidental music. It was background music to the scene. This week, again, we start with music. Mm-hmm. But it's music that's being sort of proactively contributed by uh, one of the characters. Well, it's in the, in the scene itself. Yes. We have an older man in his uh, pyjamas playing uh, the piano. Yeah, it's the second week in a row we've had a, an opening scene with a man in a bathrobe. Oh, true. Uh, he seems to be enjoying himself, very relaxed, in a, a very grand sort of room, in a, in a very grand house. Y- yeah, it's, it's immediately apparent that this is a... A big house, you know, there's money here. Uh, looks like a wel- wealthy house. Yeah. Uh, although we do find out towards the end of the episode that perhaps the uh, the wealth isn't quite as what we or everyone else is led to believe. Sure, but we are led to believe, and the impression that we get from this opening scene is that this is a, you know, a wealthy person's home. Definitely. We don't know who the people in it are we at don't. this point, but um, we, certainly that's the case. We're introduced to a second character, um, a younger man. Yeah. Uh, he enters the room. There's no animosity. There's no no. There's no concern shown by the the pianist. No, nope, no conflict. Uh, the younger man smiles. The older man continues to play the piano and smiles back. And then very quickly, what happens? Yeah, he shoots him. And this is a big departure for me, anyway, from what we'd seen in the previous episodes. Mm-hmm. Because in all three of the previous episodes, we'd got to understand who the perpetrator was, who the victim was, how they related to one another. 
uh, what had caused the circumstances leading up to the incident. Well, we're given, generally we're given motive and a bit of background. So Murder by the Book, we knew it was the relationship in terms of the writers was, was breaking yep. up. We knew who the, they both were. Last week we knew about uh, the government audit and the investigation into contracts. We did. Uh, and we, uh, with uh, but I remember Brimmer. we saw the investigation, the blackmail, and yeah, and the accident, and why, it, why it happened. Yeah, we got everything, and and I think we commented on it particularly the first week, but it was equally true the other two weeks that this was a good way to start the episodes. It gave the audience, you know, an understanding of why this has happened, what's going on, although it was a twist from the traditional who done it, yeah, approach. I think in this one we, it's a deliberate attempt to sh provide the audience, ourselves, the viewers, with a similar understanding that perhaps Columbo himself has. As we will go on to discuss, the, it's not quite as clear-cut as what we, what we or Columbo may have thought initially. Yeah, it, it's presented as one thing, uh, and it might not necessarily turn out to be that, but we do get very small snippets of information that's very much a workout as we're going along. Yeah. Opening to the show, which is in marked contrast to what we'd seen previously. Yeah. So again, we don't see the murder on the, the screen itself. And then after it, we have a lot of fast cuts yeah. uh, going to different uh, paintings on the walls. Now, you thought it was, I thought it was trying to present a dramatic uh, is it a theme or a dramatic air of tension. Yeah, well, I would, I would agree they were trying to be dramatic. This was meant to be a, you know, a shock horror moment, but. To me, the, the cuts between the pictures was vaguely humorous. Yeah, I mean, that may, again, just be from seeing it in, in 2014, I think, perhaps. Possibly. Back then, it would be, you know, it would have been more impactful or more... I think part of it is something we talked about last week with the way that the music's used. It was a very sort of blunt instrument, you know, blunt force here. You know, this is a shocking moment. Here's some shocking music, and, mm -hmm. and we'll do some cutaways to these pictures. Yeah. But I think, that, you know... It wasn't as subtle as it could have been, and for me, it, it did come across as a little bit funny. Okay, um, the younger chap, the the, the murderer, then uh, he confirms, he checks that the the victim is in fact dead. Uh, he leaves the room where the the crime has been committed, um, and he goes upstairs and returns with an electric blanket, which he plugs in and yeah. covers the body. Yes. He then does a Franklin-esque from Murder by the Book, I thought, <laughs> ransacking in order That's to... That's the exact note that I've taken. He oh, trashes the house in a similarly uncoordinated style <laughs> as Franklin did to Ferris' office in episode one. Yeah, obviously trying to make it look like there have been some sort of burglary uh, taking place. Yeah, but without putting any thought into what would happen if a burglary was taking yeah, place. Yeah, burglars tend not just to throw things around and... Yeah, yeah, and also the fact that they're, they're coming in to steal art and they shoot the man, it doesn't lend itself to the idea there would have been a struggle. It's it's maybe a, a flaw in the thinking there. Yeah. Also, what I, what always, not concerned me, but what I always uh, thought was that if you, a, a robbery of a, an art collection isn't just a random by chance, you know, break in and, you know, this, these burglars would have been professional art thieves, you would have thought, and they would have planned this quite you know, meticulously. I doubt they would have stumbled, you know, just entered when they, they, someone was in the house and, you know, had to kill him. I'm not sure if a, a typical art thief generally gets involved in murder. Sure. Or it could have been a bur burglary by someone who realised there might be things of value in this house. And I think this is actually quite an important thing to, to bear in mind because we're going to come to this when Colombo arrives at the house. But the idea or the um, indication of whether the burglars were aware of the value of the particular paintings is mm -hmm. going to be important. Okay, so the the killer uh, he goes to the, the back door, the patio door, and yeah. he attempts to make it look as if it's been forced in some way. Yeah, he opens it from the inside and then kind of attacks it with a screwdriver or something similar, mm -hmm. trying to damage or make it look damaged. Yeah. He then cuts out a number of paintings from several frames, and he takes two smaller paintings or drawings um, that are wrapped in, in brown paper. Yeah, well, yes. He so wraps them in brown paper. He wraps yes. them in brown yeah. paper, yeah. And then the doorbell rings. And for a moment you think, ah, is he going to have to you know, hide or talk himself out of, of, of this situation? Yeah. But 
he he smi- appears unperturbed. He, he seems to know yeah, what's going on. A moment later, he smiles, and he goes to the um, the door, the main door, front door. Yeah. Looks through the, the spy hole, the peephole, sees a, a younger redhead lady, female. Yep. And opens the door to her. Yes, he's um, expecting her. It seems. Yeah. Well, she apologizes for for being late. Well, he tells her she's late. Yeah, that's the first thing he says to her. Yeah. So obviously, there's a plan here. Uh, she's not kept up to date with the the schedule. Yeah, she's part of a plan, and the plan's running to a specific time, clearly. By the way, she reminds me of a, a very young Helen Mirren. Uh, ju- that's just what I thought when I was when I was watching it. Okay. Um, so, he tells her to take the paintings that are wrapped in paper, and they walk through to the, the, the piano room, the, the murder room. And when she arrives in there, she sort of recoils when she sees the, the covered body. Yeah. So she's obviously not quite as cold and calculating perhaps as he is and she it's dawned on her. It's, it's maybe something that sounded good on, on paper or in theory, but then it's presented with a dead body. It's a it's a different thing altogether. I think we yeah, all most normal people would be slightly shocked by yeah. finding finding that. Yeah. But he tries to obviously address her um hesitation there. He tells her that he couldn't possibly help her career from the gas chamber. Yeah. So I assume back I, I'm not sure what the I think they're well, there is currently the death penalty in, in LA. I don't know. Um, and I think back then you were given the choice of lethal injection or, or gas. Not too sure. I don't know. Again, possibly our listeners can help us out with that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think what that, again, we've not discussed, really, but vast majority of Colombo's crimes and the killers operate in LA with a, a death penalty. Yeah. So they've got a lot more to lose, perhaps, than people in other areas, other countries. Sure, um, and I think it's interesting that he, not just the, the death penalty reference he makes here, the fact he talks about helping her career, that maybe gives us a bit of insight into why she's involved here, what he has promised her. Yeah. He's obviously a well-known art critic, or we find out shortly that he's a well-known art critic. Mm-hmm. And clearly in a, she believes he's in a position to help her, her art succeed. Career. Yes. Yeah. Um, again, like other characters, there's a slight sort of attraction to this powerful man uh, that we've Noted in, in previous episodes. Yeah. Um, so she actually tells him, uh, well, she also calls, uh, well, she, he calls her my love. So it's more than just a professional relationship here. Yeah. They're obviously uh, There's some, something going on there. Relationship, yeah. Yeah. Um, she tells him that all these paintings belong to him now. Yeah, that's the first indication we get that he's related to the victim. Yes. And also, it's the first sort of false motive. So we would be thinking that he's killed this chap in order to get these paintings. Yeah. And he has, but not in the in the way that you would immediately assume. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they have a... Um, well, he reminds her that she still has a, a part to play in this, this plan. It's not finished as yet. Yeah. And before parting, they have a passionate kiss. And... He leaves and she smiles in delight as she looks around the, the room yeah, at these paintings. She admires the art. She clearly is a person who enjoys art. Yeah. So we then see who we learn to be Dale Kingston driving his, I think it's a Rolls Royce by the looks of it. Yeah. Again, we get this sort of blunt force, dramatic music. This is a dramatic moment. Yeah. Listen to the music. Um, and but he, nothing is said at this point. No. He is checking his watch. He appears anxious and slightly agitated. And he arrives at a, a gallery. Yeah, it appears to be some kind of exhibition going on. Yep, very seventies, uh, in the music and the dress sense. And in fact, I think he looks like he's got a tuxedo with the the flowery shirt and the very or- ornate, uh, a spectacular baroque. Outfit. So yeah, it lo- it reminds me of Austin Powers. It's almost exactly like the one that Austin Powers wore. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we see an artist talking to. What looks to be potential buyers. Yep. It's very much a, a sales a, a sales exhibition. Yes, and of, he, he gets introduced to the artist, who is a, a Sam Franklin. Yes, uh, my note again is he a relative of Ken. It's possible they live in the same city. I think it must be a nod. I mean, I'm sure that uh, the writers were able to invent different names if they if they had to. Sure, there's no reason why they would use the same name again without a reason. And yeah. we already saw in episode three the sort of referenced episode one with the Mrs. Melville books in the bookshelf. Yeah. So again, maybe this is a nephew or a cousin or a... Could be. Second cousin. I'm sure they could use other names if they wanted to. So yeah, I'm guessing there's some kind of nod there. 
Now, we, Matilda, who appears to be the owner of the gallery who's putting on Sam's, yeah. uh, Franklin's ex exhibition, she is delighted to see this Dale Kingston arrive. Yeah, this is the first, first indication we get that he's somebody who is known. He's a famous art critic. It somebody with a, a bit of power. Or at least in the local community. Yeah, but, a bit of yeah. authority. Yeah. Um, he, uh, the way he talks to the gallery owner and the way he speaks about the painter Franklin's work suggests that he is a fairly arrogant man. He's not afraid to, to yeah. speak his mind. I mean, fair enough, he is a, a critic, but uh, he seems particularly unpleasant and probably someone who enjoys yeah. being Look, I think we a find, Simon Cowell-esque. I think we find out later on that this is not an exhibition he would ordinarily have attended. Exactly. So he's here to create his alibi at Columbo. He, he maybe feels question. this art is below him. I, I think you're correct there. Um, he does check the time, though. We, he, we see he does. He, he speaks to him, and he, again, he, he checks his watch and asks Franklin what time it is. So, again, this is establishing where, you know, exactly where he is at, at specific times. Yeah. We go back to the, the house where the murder was committed, and we see the accomplice. She is waiting, watching. She's checking her watch uh, before, obviously, a predetermined time yeah. removes the electric blanket and returns that upstairs. Yeah. We then get back to the gallery and we see Kingston chatting to a number of different uh, ladies, artists, people who are there, obviously making sure that people are aware that he is there. Yeah, he's making himself seen. Yeah. He's not unlike uh, Ken Franklin, unlike um, General Hollister and unlike Brimmer. Uh, Brimmer doesn't appear to be as charismatic and as suave as these other three characters. Right. You know, I believe that they are naturally, you know, quite charismatic. Would have a way with different people, whether it be male or female, to persuade them. Yet he doesn't seem as someone who would uh, be as engaging, or someone who you'd want to, other than for what he can offer in terms of the art world. Sure, he doesn't seem the type of type of chap who's massively charming. Okay, that's one one way of looking at it, I suppose, yeah. Do you disagree? Do you think he, as a I, character he was... It didn't occur to me particularly. He does seem like someone who uses his influence rather than his natural charm. I would agree with you on that. Certainly yeah. the people that we see him uh, manipulating are people who are aware of his professional standing. It's a nice performance. He's played by uh, Ross Martin. Uh, Ross Martin was a little bit of trivia here, was Peter Falk's acting coach when Peter was 12 years old. Okay. So a long time relationship and association. Yeah. Um, he worked with Peter Falk in 1965's film The Great Race, about a, a car race. So it's shortly prior to this? Short, uh, yeah, it'll be six, seven years. Maybe around about the time of the... I don't know, you remember when the first pilot was? The first pilot was 68. So coming out of that into this... That's still a bit of a gap, isn't it? A bit of a gap. Um, and he will be most famous for Wild Wild West, the, the TV show. Okay. They made a, a movie a few years ago with Will Smith. Yes, I remember that film. Yep. So I saw that, that you know, I've seen that movie, uh, but not saw the uh, original TV series. He played a character called Artemis Gordon alongside Robert Conrad. Okay. So that was a, a partnership. And... Robert Conrad himself uh, turns up as a, a Columbo villain in a, a future episode. Oh, there you go. We're, we're seeing these connections every week. It seems there to are be a, a lot of connections. I think it's probably yeah studio related. Yeah, you know, we, we could look into that a little bit more. Um, but Ross Martin sadly died aged sixty-one in, in nineteen eighty-one from a, a heart attack. So that's a shame. No longer with us. Um, we'll go back to the episode. So we're back in the house. Yes. And the uh, accomplice, who at this point in time, this is the other thing, it does take a while before we are introduced to the, the names and the characters yeah, themselves. Yeah, we touched on that a minute ago. It's really a sort of a slow burn at the start. We're getting drip-fed yeah. details. I think for clarity here, or just for ease of listening, we should identify uh, the, the protagonist. So we've got Dale Kingston, who is the killer. He's, yes, the nephew of the victim. Nephew, uh, the victim is Rudy Matthews. Yes. We only see him for a glimpse at the very yeah. start. Uh, and the accomplice uh, is Stacy. Tracy. Tracy. Yeah. Tracy. 
Um, but we don't find out her name until later. Much in, later, right? Yeah. Episode. Okay. So we have Tracy in the house. She notices that there is a private security guard patrolling. Yeah, and, and I think we're led to assume that this is a, a deliberate part of the plan. This yes, is maybe a scheduled doubt, routine. She this. knows certainly. She she's she needs to use this. Uh, yeah. This guard in the plan. So she watches him through the the people. Yep. Uh, again, as we speak, clearly expecting him to be here on his on his route or his route. As he drives off, she fires a gun into the air from the the back patio door. Yep, to get him back. Obviously, attract yeah, attracting his attention. So he stops his car, and returns. He's got his own set of keys. That was interesting. Yeah. He opens up. Uh, he goes through the house through the the, the front door, mm-hmm. and sees or hears someone leave through the back garden, through the back door and down the back garden. Yeah, we, d- we don't know at this moment, but we later find out that he heard someone in high heels leaving. Yeah, and I think that was, as we've discussed previously, I think, uh, earlier today, Ian, that must be a, a deliberate... Yeah, I think we conclude that this must be part of the plan, because we know that the long-term aim of this scheme yeah. um, relies on there being a female perpetrator. And the guard obviously discovers the the dead body lying yeah lying in the in the room yeah we're then introduced to it's almost it's a back and forth between two locations it's a very sort of quick switch set of scenes yeah between Kingston being sociable yeah and uh, like I say it seems if he's forcing it's not his natural it's not his natural character to be quite uh, amiable yeah. and and, uh, and sociable. So we see him, you know, establishing this alibi. This yeah. alibi, um, and then we see uh, the accomplice escaping. Uh, sta- yeah. Yes, Crazy, leave, yeah. Tracy leaving the uh, leaving the house. The next major scene is the house again. Yeah. And Columbo's entrance. Yes. So, what do you what do you remember about that? Okay, the first thing that struck me about this scene that I thought, wow, that wouldn't fly now, is that they refer to the the staff at the house as servants. Yeah. And I was thinking, this was only the 70s. This is not like the 1920s or something like this. This is a recent or relatively recent piece of work. And they're still referring to these people as servants. The police are referring to them as servants. Yeah. That's who they are. And that was quite surprising to me. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't pick up on that myself, but now that you mention it, yeah, it's, uh, you certainly wouldn't get that today, I wouldn't have thought. No, no. I, I think there would be staff yeah. nowadays. They would be employees of the, the homeowner. And there's no indication that they're treated badly. It's just, I think, there's something, I think just that word has sort of inherent associations that you probably, you couldn't use it now. You wouldn't use it now, no. It wouldn't be appropriate. Disrespectful. Um but as, as you said, there, there's no indication they're treated badly, and in fact, the opposite. You know, uh, we, le- we later find that the staff have been left. Yeah. Well, they seem happy, well. and well, they're they're very much uh, Evans, yeah, who appears to be the, the the butler type or the the main yes. head of the household, the staff household, um, is very uh, defensive of his employer well, and the, first the thing collection is, himself. Yes, the first thing he does is he stops Columbo from smoking around the painting. Well, I'm going to bring that up in, certainly in a moment as well, yeah. So he, we see Columbo looking at paintings. Uh, we should describe there's other police officers yes, that's around busy the scene. scene of crime, yeah, they're doing what you would expect people are being interviewed. They're looking at the, uh, the scene of the crime. Yeah, this is similar to episode two. Episodes, in fact, it's not. It's it's first episode. Not similar to any of the other episodes. This is the first time where the first time we see Columbo is with other police officers. Mm, in episode, I thought episode two... They well, Robert called uh, Br- uh, Brimmer in the scrapyard. No, because they stop him in his car. Ah, okay. So you mean so the actual first time the you first time see you him. see Columbo. This is the first episode where the first time you see Columbo he's, he, in a, he's with a, other police officers. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, so the coroner uh, leaves the um, leaves the scene of the, the body yeah. and confidently states that it was the, the, the victim died by a single gunshot around 11 o'clock, give or take a, a minute, minute or two due yeah. to the, the temperature of the of the corpse. Yes. Um, and then we see Kingston arriving. Yes. Well, we get a lot of exposition around this point, but yes. Yeah, it's 
I think, yeah, this is a scene which the information could have probably been delivered to the viewer in a, a more subtle way. Uh, the thing that stood out for me was that I think Columbo asks, you know, what happens. I think he asks if there was any other, who, who gets the, the inheritance? Yeah. All, all these paintings. Yeah, and the servant, Mr. Evans, and is talking about Mr. how he hopes he'll keep the collection going. And but he's the only living relative and yes. therefore it should uh, be, it will probably, probably be handed over to him. Yeah. So that was fairly heavy, heavily heavy handed. handed. Yeah, I would say so. Um, but it's a challenge because you've got a lot of information to give to the viewer and they've chosen to do this slow drip approach up to this point and then they hit you with it all and I don't know if that was the best way to do it. It makes it difficult. I mean I had to go back a couple of times to pick up everything there and I think as a casual viewer maybe you don't need all that information. Maybe you don't need to take everything in but mm -hmm. I don't see why they would slow drip to that point and then flood you with everything all sure. at once. Okay. We find out that there have been two items uh, stolen. Two items are missing. Yeah. So there's been an attempt at other, other uh, or thefts of other items, but there only appears to be two pastel drawings which have. Been yeah, and there's a gun missing as well. There is. That's a good point. Um, Columbo's first interaction with Kingston is a little bit odd. Yeah, of course. This is the, yeah. This is where Columbo first encounters our killer. Uh, tell me, Mr. Kingston, uh, has anybody tried to rob this place before? Certainly. This place is a magnet for art thieves. It's one of the finest collections in the world. Is that so? Yes. Really? Very impressive. I love that quote about the house being a magnet for art thieves. And we're already starting to see Columbo working in this guy. We are. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a nice turn of phrase. Um, I, I'm, I was slightly... I, I'm always slightly uneasy about, even although we understand or we know that in this case Kingston is the, the killer, we can't assume that Columbo knows this already. And if that is the case, it's fairly insensitive with regards to his, you know, his approach, his initial, you know, dialogue yeah. and interaction. He doesn't offer condolences. He doesn't, you know, say anything else that might be expected. This is the yeah. chap's only living. Relative, Relative, yeah. Uh, you might assume that they were very close and he would be distraught, but he discusses what signatures on two different paintings. Well, I think though I'm, I'm less upset about it this week than I was in Death Lends a Hat because there's reasons why Columbo might be thinking there was inside involvement here. True. Whether it's from his own art knowledge or whether he's spoken to others about this, he seems to have an idea about the value of the paintings, about who is an established artist and who is not. He also has information, as we come to learn shortly after this, that the alarm system has been bypassed and it's likely this was done from the inside. So with that information, not saying that Columbo should be able to conclude who did it and all that at this stage, but he has reason to believe that there might be some involvement from somebody within the property. And there's only a limited number of people that could be. Well, that, that, that's true, that's, that's fair enough. So the paintings that have gone, I think they said they were Degas paintings, who's an, an actual known artist. Okay, perhaps you can educate me then. Yeah, I, I don't know much about him particularly, but my, my understanding is he exists. He's a real person. It's real art. Whether those were actually paintings of his, we would need to do a bit of research, which I've not done. No, I don't, to find I don't think they will. But um, in the context of the show, and, and bearing in mind that this is 1971, we're talking about these paintings being worth over half a million dollars. Oh, that's a lot. Of I think nowadays that would be millions, mm -hmm. even without any inflation in value. Okay, so that leads me on to another issue I have. The security in that house, Yeah. leaving aside, you know, even if the alarm was on, these things worth in today's value, you know, today's money, millions of pounds should be in vaults, they should be behind iron bars, they should be protected by a security guard. Yeah. It was a patio door with an alarm that any, that a brick, you know, you could have smashed the window, walked in and, and stolen paintings yeah. worth millions of pounds. It seemed utterly under protected considering the, the, the value of the, 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 the paintings in the art collection. I'd agree with that. So, yes, that, I don't have an answer for that. That <laughs> does seem to be the case. They were saying the the paintings had just come back from the exhibition, so it could be that there was a transition period there. Yeah, 
possibly, but still, but, yeah, you, so you wouldn't be doing you that. You would think there would be better protection, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, did you notice that Columbo lights a cigar uh, during the... I lit- couldn't tell if it was lit or not. I yeah, didn't did, catch him lighting he, it. He, he lit the cigar, so obviously, fragrant disregard for the request <laughs> uh, of of Evans. Yeah. Uh, whether, or not, whether or not it was deliberate or a, a force of habit just to spark up a, yeah. a cigar when he's doing his uh, investigation. No, that's right. And, and and this is the moment as well where Columbo reveals the, the knowledge that he either has or has obtained in relation to the value of the art. Yeah, well, an, he points it to an, an inconsistency, doesn't yeah. he? What, what is that inconsistency? Well, the inconsistency is that the most valuable art in the house was stolen. But that of the other ones that were removed from frames, they weren't valuable ones compared to some that were left on the wall. Mm-hmm. So if the person stealing knew the value, why were they taking these lower value paintings? If they didn't know the value, how come they got the most valuable by far? And yeah. those were the only things that they got away with. So th- there are possible explanations for that, but again, it's a reason for Colombo to be suspicious of the way things present themselves. Okay. We are then introduced to a female police officer called Sally, and Colombo asks the guard to wait in the house, yep. and Sally goes out to the, the, the back garden of the patio door. So we're outside there, um, and Colombo states that he's not sure why the alarm did not go off. Yeah. He says, firstly, this is a, again another thing that I'm not sure about. He says that a pro, a professional thief, they crack windows. Yeah. Really? It seemed a little bit flaky there to me. I think that an amateur thief with no knowledge of alarm systems would be forced to smash a window. Yeah. A professional thief, especially a professional art thief. Maybe I've just watched too many movies. But it's yeah. not something that you don't steal art, you know, art, artwork and paintings off the cuff when you need some quick cash on a Friday evening. You, that's your, if you're an art thief, you're, a professional thief would have, would have to expect more sophisticated and complex security measures. See, this is the thing where I, I am struggling because I don't know what the norm was, what type of security system you would have had, whether it was something very basic or whether they had more advanced. I mean, we saw... Brimmer's CCTV back in episode 2. I wouldn't have imagined they had CCTV in 71. So, being, you know, born in the 80s, I don't have no. that knowledge even, to understand le- it. Even leaving aside technological um, systems, if you have an art collection that's worth millions and millions of pounds, rather than have, having a communal security guard which is on patrol, yeah. you could have someone stationed in the house full time. I'm sure that, you know if you can afford the, the art, you can afford that protection. Yeah, I think... In fact, you're, I, I'd imagine that your insurance company would in no way be satisfied <laughs> with the, yes. the, the protection that they have. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, it's always a little bit off to me. Yeah, it's a little bit odd. An unusual one. Anyway, Colombo gets Sally to run down the stairs... Uh, from the the back garden, yep. and the guard confirms that that was the the noise of her high heels, uh, was the noise that he heard previously. Yeah, it's not the most scientific of experiments, but yeah, oh. they, they get the point made, I suppose. Again, you know, back in the seventies, the guys not perhaps wear sort of boots and perhaps boots with heels on them. I don't know. Oh, never did. I. I'm sure I've saw some images and pictures of the guys with stacked heels and. Yeah, again, you wonder, is this is this Columbo investigating, Disco. or is this Columbo trying to fit things to the theory? Well, we'll we will get to that later. I think there's a, a case that we find that, yeah, rather than being totally open-minded, he goes with his gut and tries to, f- even when presented with what appears to be fairly watertight evidence, he tries to make the... You know, the evidence fit his, his predetermined theory. Yeah, I mean, we'll come back to this again, but I don't think he ever really tries to tackle the whole alibi thing. I think he just gets forgotten about once he has decided this guy committed the crime. Sure. Um, and Columbo admits that he thinks that the thief was a woman, but only one of them. Or, certainly, yes, there was more than one. There's a reference to there being more than one, and yeah. you weren't convinced by that either. Well, the explanation as to why he thinks there's more than one is that the number of paintings would require more than one person. Now, yeah. one person can carry an awful lot of paintings which have been ripped out of or cut out, cut out of uh, frames. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think, I could, you know, you could personally, you know, roll them up, you could carry a significant amount. If you had a large sort of hold-all bag, 
Yeah. You could roll up an awful lot of paintings and take it. I don't think you need two people to carry, you know, dozens of paintings, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think it's a waterproof theory. No. Um, so where do we go from there? Well, Columbo talks again um, to our perpetrator and, and says he wants to place a trace on the phone in case anyone phones. He talks about this theft of art, how do folk deal with art that they've stolen? And they talk well, about them trying to sell yeah, it quickly. But, sorry, before then, he also believes that another explanation to the being two, two people or more than one is that there must have been an inside person. Well, that's yes, we talked about that briefly a moment ago, yes, to get the past the alarm. Yeah, sure, but again, another weakness or another issue I have is that he's not, there's no consideration or discussion on other methods of bypassing the alarm. So, if they, the ch we know that the, um, the victim was up playing the piano still awake. Yeah. Maybe the alarm had not been set as yet. Possibly. But I think part, we need to bear in mind that what Columbo says might not just be what he thinks. Because he's talking to someone, so presumably he's got a reason. So it could be that he's trying to give the impression that this is how I am thinking. Sure. To either induce actions or to get them thinking a certain way themselves. So it might not be that that's his complete theory. It might just be that's how he wants to present it at this time to this guy. That's possible. So I interrupted you there, Ian. You're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I was talking about the the theft of art, and he has a discussion um, at this point. He talks to Kingston about the ways that art thieves would dispose of the paintings, and he's told it's effectively like a kidnap and ransom. Yeah, if it's not stolen to order, it could be done on a, a kidnap basis, and they try and get money off the the owner to, to give it back, essentially. Yeah. And Columbo, in this case, says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to tap your phones, monitor your phone lines, yeah. in case someone phones in demanding a, a a ransom. Yeah, and he's done that in such a way that there's not really any possible chance that the guy can say no. Not at all. And the way he asks the question, I think he says, you don't have a problem with this, do you? you, are, you there's no reason why you would have a problem with this. Yeah, and the guy and he sort of looks at him, yeah. he stares at it, and he has to say yes. So I think at this point, we can assume that Columbo is certainly suspicious of, of Kingston. Yeah, oh, well, I think like we said a moment ago, if he's got the impression it could be an inside person, that really narrows it down to four people and one of them's dead. Yeah. We then go to the uh, to Tracy's home. Yes. And she, we see her trying to call, who we assume to be uh, Kingston, yes. get, getting no answer. So she's getting a bit frustrated, I think. Yeah, she goes back to her painting. We see the painting that she's doing. And we then go to back to the, the gallery, the studio. Yeah, we talked about this again last week, the short scenes. This is a, we've had a few of these now yeah. in this episode. They, they do seem to be enjoying that approach, taking yeah. the, the snippets of information and giving them to you quickly and moving on. I really enjoyed this scene. Uh, Columbo turns up and uh, Franklin, the artist, is in the midst of painting a nude. Yes. Columbo firstly speaks to the owner, Matilda. Yeah, and she is telling him she she's a bit much to drink a few a few glasses of wine too many the previous night can't really remember a lot of times and, and things like yeah. that and he best speak to to Franklin yeah so he walks through to another part of the studio where where Franklin is painting this lady and he he walks in and immediately realizes that there's a, eyes, a naked yeah. and he avert, he does a, a very quick about turn or a, a turn to the right and averts his uh, yeah averts his eyes. Obviously, obviously in a massive amount of uh, embarrassment. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting as well. If you see, you see the painting and the, the focus of the painting is the flowers that are sitting there. The yeah. And he's yeah. quite, the, the, the artist's a bit fed up with the woman as well. It's like I he think he, with her. he is totally fed up and she's a bit snappy with him as well. Yeah. Uh, they both, I think, just want to get it over and done with. But yeah, it's in it. I, I just like the uh, how awkward he feels and uh, averting his eyes. Yeah. But the artist, in any event, isn't much use to. Columbo because like any normal person he doesn't really remember the details of the conversation. No, but what he does do is he tells Columbo that he remembers that um, Kingston had a, an issue with his watch and he had to confirm what time it was. He does say that. We are then, well, we, they, then they then bring, Matilda then brings in the parking attendant. I love this bit because the Columbo is outraged that the valet got a tip of as high as two dollars. <laughs> to be fair, I mean, I, I I don't know what you what the what the uh, rate would be these days to, for someone to pack your car. I mean, you're not you're not going to give them, you know, 
I would have thought. I would think if you were a famous person, it would be more than. He's not famous. He's an art critic. Yeah. You know, he's not famous. He's famous in that world, but that's yeah. you know, he's not a that the chap wouldn't know who he was or. Yeah, I think though what this I mean, also how many, does. How many famous art critics do you know? There's the really annoying one, Brian. Exactly. Something. No, yeah, I don't know. Any. <laughs> but you've got a good comparison here between the two dollars being an outrageous tip and paintings worth half a million dollars. Sure. So you can see there that these are very valuable, very, very valuable. And I think even more than the characters can give the impression of. Mm-hmm. I mean, this would be like a major incident nowadays of a painting of that value was stolen. Yeah. The purpose of talking to the parking attendant is that the parking attendant um, confirms that, or tells Colombo that Kingston asked to help, asked him to help him look for a missing cufflink. Yes, that's uh, how he justifies the tip. The tip, yeah, and they looked in the trunk of the car as well. Yeah, to to try and find it, but found nothing. And also, he asked him for the time because his watch was broken. So again, this is Kingston attempting to create a yeah, or, or for people to remember him. Yeah, and again, the guy remembers the time. He says yeah. it was five to eleven. Okay, and it's also a means of sh- of showing that uh, there was no body in the the trunk as well. Yes. Um, so we then see the accomplice uh, Tracy watching Kingston on TV doing some sort of he's presenting a show, show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and she calls the studio and gets put through to him yeah before he takes the call he has a bit of a moan that his producer he doesn't like the camera pointing at him after he's finished speaking yeah He's a bit of a diva, isn't he? He's not Seems the, that way. He's like I say, he's not the easiest to go on with or work with. No, and he doesn't. He, whether he's agitated because of what's going on or whether that's just how he is, I think he's probably like that most of the time. Yeah, he's on the phone to Tracy, and Colombo appears just at that moment. Yeah, you can imagine the the reaction he would have to that Colombo yeah. showing up again. Oh, and come he has, on. so he has to pretend that it's a basically a nuisance call or a, a, a unimportant call yes. that hangs up. And Colombo makes it clear that he's noticed that he hung up. I also, the discussion, he mentions that, you know, he gets lots of um, women at phoning up asking for advice. Yeah. And Colombo says, you know, oh, so that was a, a female on the on the phone, which is a coincidence because he, they believe that they may be looking for a female ransom yeah. uh, demander. Yes. Colombo points out that Kingston has not been at home uh, much recently and that the the telephone tap has been pretty much yeah. useless again i think this is him perhaps hinting that this may be a you know a reason to be for him to be suspicious yeah yeah no i think the note i've taken here is that colombo is clearly very least intrigued by kingston mm-hmm. he, yeah. uh, but kingston tells colombo that his uncle had an ex-wife and that she may well be someone who a potential uh, painting kidnapper may want to contact. Yeah. and there's But there's no indication at this point that she he's not trying to over-egg the pudding like we've seen others do with relation to his framing. You know, no. he's not like, oh, she might have killed him or, you know, she always hated him. You know, it's a fairly, he gets a fairly standard introduction. True. He does, I think, refer to her as trying. Yes. So, you know, it's not, as you say, it's not Nothing too too drastic. Nothing that would lead to any suspicion. Um, Colombo actually tells him that he is aware of her. Yeah. And they've spoken and there is a, a wire tap or a, a phone tap on her, her phone as well. Yeah. And we then are told by Colombo that he has some, some problems, some loose ends, some issues that he can't explain which are niggling at him. Yeah. Um, the first being that the patio lock was not forced from the outside. Yes. So he says that's been confirmed by the the guys. The lock guys. The yeah. lock guys. The lock specialists. Yeah. Yeah. This department of locks. So how did a how did a stranger get in? How did they get entry? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Colombo also tells Kingston that he had to check out his alibi. And that he is in the clear. So Kingston, yeah, Kingston plays along, and says that Colombo must be disappointed to lose his uh, his prime suspect. Yeah. 
Colombo then goes on to talk about another thing that bugs him. He asks why Kingston was looking in the trunk of his car for a cufflink. Yeah, but Kingston's got a, a reasonable excuse for that. He talks about the, the jacket having been put in the trunk of the car. There's a reasonable belief that the cufflink could have been in there. It wasn't, and eventually he found it up yeah. inside his sleeve. Colombo, however, continues with some of the issues that he has, although he's pretending that uh, it's, uh, it should be seen in a positive, positive yeah, manner. Yeah, he's, he's doing this thing where he's trying to put this other person in a particular frame of mind or get them to relax a bit, because I think he feels he gets more information in that well, scenario. But in this case, he's inferring guilt by claiming that he is innocent. So what he says is that uh, most people cannot remember you know, what time events happen at, you know, yeah. where they were and what they were doing at exact times. But in Kingston's case, they know exactly where he was and at, at what time. Yeah. So he's implying again that it's very convenient, very contrived. Too, yeah. it's too convenient. Um. And as we're leaving, or as Columbo is leaving, he asks Kingston to have a look at a painting that he's rented for his father-in-law. So another mention of a yes, another family member. I think you know it's generally always his wife's side of the family. Yes. That he re refers to. Um, and he shows him this painting that he rented from from, Fla uh, from Franklin. Yeah. Doesn't think too much of it, does he? No, this is when he's questioning why um, he would have gone to that particular exhibition. It wasn't the type of art he would normally be interested in, Columbo thinks. Yeah, so he's, again, he's suggesting that he was there. He is basically he was hinting at the fact that he was using this as a he's, He was a means creating of an alibi. An alibi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Kingston says that you know he has to you know he's paid by his employers to to go to different galleries and yeah and, and pay and more for bad reviews yeah yeah so that's just I think it's believable job. I don't think that's so, it definitely yeah I think that, that is it uh, yeah I mean an art critic doesn't just go to view people who he he likes yeah um he Columbo then does a an almost does a sort of one more thing he turns around and says that he dropped by Kingston's apartment. Uh, prior to coming to the yeah. the TV station. And Kingston gets really annoyed. Yeah, it's he, an interesting exchange, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think we've got a clip of this exchange here. Yeah. One more thing. It, it just, it'll just take a second. I stopped by your apartment a few times. Why, do you want to search my place? No, just to ask you something about art. You said you had some books and things there that I could see. You may look at anything you wish. You can snoop in all of my closets. You can peek under the beds. You won't find any stolen paintings. Oh, really? I've never said anything. Here, would about you like the key to my apartment? You may simply leave it under the mat when you leave. Oh, really? I, no, 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 go ahead. I insist. See what I live like. Find out what kind of human being I am. Learn everything you can about me. Well, I, I mean, I admit it would be more convenient, but uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kingston. Uh, I'm sorry I took up so much of your time. I might drop by and borrow a few books or something like that. I enjoyed that. I thought it was. A, I, I thought it was a, a nice little bit of a, a humour to it. I thought the, the 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 both characters played off each other very well. Yeah, and it was um, inevitable where they were going, but they were both kind of playing their role in this little yeah. exchange. And as we leave that, um, Kingston looks quite bemused. He looks as if he he, feel, he realizes he's been been done up a little bit there. Yeah. So we then go to a hillside where yes. Kingston is meeting the accomplice Tracy. Yes, and he takes from her the gun, gun and the painting. He does. Um, she, I think, again suggests that perhaps she's not happy with the relationship that they have. Yeah. That he doesn't. He's not, you know, looking for the same things. Perhaps you know, personally and from a professional level, that you know that she had hoped. Yeah, I think she's maybe looking for a bit of reassurance here. Mm -hmm. Um. Anyway, they, they depart, they're going their separate ways, they're about to go their separate ways. Yeah, she asks what more he needs her to do, and he says nothing. Well, no, I think she asks her when, when, they'll, when they, uh, they will see each other again, or yeah, when will uh, I yeah, see you again. when will I see you, and he says very soon. Very soon, and he we see him picking up at a rock. Looking very menacing. And again, as we've seen in other episodes, we don't, you know, we don't see the, the actual killing, but we see the reaction to yeah. the impending death, yes. the certainty of death. As he strikes the the rock down on on, on her head and and 
and kills her. Yeah. A couple of things about this particular scene. I think it's probably first. Uh, first, it's probably worthwhile noting that the actress uh, who played who played Tracy yeah. was Rosanna Hoffman. Okay. Uh, interesting because she was in fact married to the uh, Columbo co-creator Richard Levinson, uh, and she was married until his death and untimely death in nineteen eighty-seven. Oh, there you go. So that was uh, that was his wife. It's a good connection. The other issue I have, or the issue I have with this scene, is, and we spoke again earlier today with this, and I think you might, you know, you might have a slightly, slightly different opinion, but yeah. for someone. The first murder was very meticulously planned between both of them. Yeah. He does not appear to be the type of killer who is able to be quick on his feet. And in fact, in quite a few occasions, Columbo has put forward problems that he has. And unlike other uh, murderers, yeah. he's not quickly tried to provide the explanations and answers. Uh, no, he's played it differently. He has played it differently. So it makes me think that, yeah, he, he, he pl- he's very methodical. He's planned these murders. So the initial murder was well thought out. It was quite devious, quite sophisticated. That being said, um, or taking that into consideration, why therefore does he pick up a rock to kill? We're assuming, of course, that he, he always planned to kill uh, Tracy. I think he must have done. Okay, in that, okay. in that case then, if he was plan to, planning to kill her, why did he pick up a rock? That he could not have known would have okay. been lying there. Well, we know that he's arranged to meet her in this particular location. Okay. So, we assume he probably also, and again, it's an assumption, but we assume he also probably intended to have the plan whereby he would kill her and then push the car down the cliff. Yeah. Which means he couldn't shoot her. It had to be a blunt force, so it looked uh-huh. like it was part of an accident. So, he must have intended to hit her with something. Mm-hmm. So, whether he had something else with him or whether he brought that rock with him, or whether he found that rock there and abandoned his original plan, thinking this would be fine. You see, I, I agree that could be what we could assume, but why didn't they just show him using that other other weapon anyway? Yeah. Because the picking up of the, you know, makes it look as if it's not been planned. You don't, Yeah. in, in many cases where there's a mur- in a murder scene, you know, if you don't bring a weapon, you know, you can often claim that, you know, it, was un- it wasn't uh, premeditated. Yeah. So, I, again, I'm just, it doesn't sit well with me that particular scene. I think that, you know, he should have, his character should have planned that better and and and, and brought used a weapon that he brought yeah. with him. There's a bit. There's a few too many variables there that you would be yeah. uncomfortable with if you were the killer. Okay. We then go back to Kingston's home. <laughs> yes, I like this. This is a great scene. Uh, so he arrives back home. He has. He's carrying the. And this is an, an important scene as well. He's carrying the the paintings, the two paintings given to him in by an art bag. Yes. And an art bag. Um, and he checks under his mat and in his door, and there's the keys there. So Columbus returned the key, yeah. So he believes that the house must be empty. He enters his home, and Columbo is asleep on a sitting on a chair. He's asleep, but no, I think he's been waiting for him. Of course he has, but he's pretending that he's a, he's been he's fell asleep and he's been disturbed. Yeah. Um, Kingston is not happy about this, and Columbo is well, clearly not. He's quite carrying a, the paintings. He's carrying, <laughs> he must be utterly shocked here. He, he knows he's very very close to. The gas chamber at this point. Yeah. You know, if Columbo you know, insists on seeing what's in that that case or in that, that bag, yeah. he's got a lot of explaining to do. Um, well, he doesn't have any explaining to do. I think he's just strung up at that point. And Columbo actually asks him, you know, what, what have you got there? What have you been buying? And he, I think he said it's some sort of insipid watercolours, nothing worth discussing. Um, Columbo's been reading about watercolours. He has been reading it. A, a, a huge coincidence and asks if he can see them yeah and he's, he's physically prevented from looking in the bag yeah really he makes a grab for it he places his hands into the, the crucially, bag yeah. crucially places his an- hands into the bag and, and and touches the paintings but Kingston is in no mood for this sort of nonsense and tells Columbo that you know leave it alone leave it alone he's tired he has to get to yeah. his bed and then the phone rings the phone rings and this is interesting because I think this scene again, we saw this quite a lot the last episode, the Deadweight episode. There's an indeterminate passage of time. You've got two scenes in a row that have the same character in them. You've got Dale in both of these uh, scenes. We don't know how long's between them. Yeah. And it's never really spelled out. It's more left up to your imagination. Mm -hmm. So you can make it fit 
however your however your brain can make these scenes scenes fit and these timelines fit, you're left to do that yourself. Yeah. So this call informs him. Uh, he's told that they have found a body. Yeah. Um. Now this is explained later on because Columbo homicide detective would not normally be informed about. No, but he's he's asked to be informed of anything that's art related, and the the victim or the the dead person in the accident is yeah. an art uh, student. Yeah. So he obviously um, is suspicious that, in fact, you know what what's happened here, is that he if he suspects Kingston and he suspects that there was an accomplice, um, he obviously believes that this is a likely outcome, that Kingston is going to try and get rid of this uh, this 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 partner and this potential yeah. this potential you know uh, mouth that could uh, get him into trouble. Yeah. Yeah, so he was. I think Colombo was uh, expecting this. Possibly. So the next scene we have is within the lawyer's office. Yeah, this is another good scene. Yeah. Uh, so Colombo meets uh, the the victim's ex-wife. Yes. Mrs. Edna Matthews. That's her. Uh, and also Kingston, uh, and the lawyer. This is also the scene where, shortly after she's died, we learn for the first time the name of the accomplice. Yes. We've been calling her Tracy, but we don't actually find out watching the episode until we now. don't. Her name's Tracy O'Connor. Yeah, but this is the first time you hear it. Yeah. Uh, Columbo, he has a painting with him and he shows it to Kingston. It's uh, one of Tracy's paintings. It is one of Tracy's paintings and he asks if he recognised the, the signature or the name. Or if he liked it as well. If he liked it. He doesn't like it, he nope. doesn't recognise the signature. And he claims he has no recollection or no knowledge of the, the artist. Yeah. He's quite um, hostile, I thought, at that point. He no? is. And Colombo says that he thought he may because she was an art student. And rightly so. Kingston says, well, you know, there must be thousands yeah. of art students in the, in the area. Why would you expect me to know this particular one? Yeah. Uh, thinking that is a sufficient answer. Yeah. But it's not. Not for Colombo. Because... Because Colombo has checked and realised... Oh, yes, he'd taught the class. And that, that, that he had put on a, a lecture or a talk yeah. and that she was uh, in the... She was a, 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 in the audience. Or yeah, but that's, I mean, it's still not pinning it down. It's not, but there is a completely. connection. It's not there, pinning it down. There's a connection, yeah. But you're starting to build up a... you know, a, Sure. A, a list of coincidences here. Um, We're going to the reading of the will. So we're going to the, the, the boardroom and the, the will is being read. What is the outcome of that? Okay, so the, the servants are hmm. given an annual stipend of $2,000, which they seem very happy about. They seem over the moon. I would imagine that's close to what they were, maybe their annual salary or something no, like that, so maybe even yeah, more. That's, I was, well, we found, no, um, we, do you remember Brimmer offering Columbo the job? And I think we found out, we worked out that Columbo was on maybe less than 10, uh, around about 9, 10,000, yeah, 8, so, 9, 10,000 pounds. So two, and that's a police lieutenant, so 2,000 for a manual sort of I don't know, I mean worker. these days, what would a fairly senior, a fairly senior cop maybe on? More? Not, on no. dollars? Ah, who knows. Yeah. But anyway, they seem happy enough. Yeah, they seem happy with that money. Um, yes, the, the big um, drama then comes. The big reveal. So, uh, Dale Kingston's to receive everything. Oh, well, let me think. Under exception of the art collection. Which is all that he wanted. Which is all that there is as well, as yes. we find out shortly. We find out shortly yeah. uh, so, everyone's shocked. Yes. The the art collection has been left to the ex-wife, Edna. Yes. She's shocked by this. The yeah. staff, the servants are shocked by this. The lawyer is shocked by this. Well, no, the lawyer's the not lawyer's shocked by this. The lawyer's read it already. The lawyer read it and invited Columbo uh, along. Because of this, Because yeah. of this, yeah. Uh, so, Colombo shocked by this. Yeah, it's clear that the will's only a month old. Ten days. Yeah, yeah. Well, less than a month. So I think it was last month. So we're, this yeah. must be the start of the next month. But essentially, yes. And we also find that Dale's inheritance is worthless because the yeah. house is rented. The house is rented. They're, they sold off all the other um, assets, assets yeah. of the of the estate. So effectively, there's nothing there. And in fact, I think in the reading of the the will, it was quite funny. He the the victim had mentioned that to he was leaving to his uh, nephew 
who had enjoyed free of you know yeah. rent free etc etc for the last ten years has and yeah and to say wrongly divorced <laughs> yes so it's quite nice yes it was a good one um, two characters in this this particular scene may be worth worth yes, mentioning the the lawyer is a well known actor the lawyer uh, the lawyer and Edna yes two Oscar winners continuing the theme from the previous two weeks. Colombo certainly does attract, you know, high quality, high caliber uh, guest stars. The lawyer, um, a lot of people will be familiar familiar with, is um, Don Amici. Yeah. He, to me, I mean, he had he's had a very long career from I think back in the thirties. It's one of those faces you just yes. you recognize it, and you know you've seen it in something. Yes. Uh, but to me, he's an eighties legend. He won an Oscar in nineteen eighty six for uh, his role in as Art in Cocoon. Right. Which it's a he, very popular movie. A very popular movie. He was also in Trading Places yep. and Harry and the Hendersons, or as we know over here, or knew over here, it was Bigfoot and the Hendersons. Yeah. He died uh, in 1993, aged 86. And Edna, she died in 2002, aged 79, but she was an Oscar winner also uh, in 1952 for playing Stella in A Streetcar Named Desire. It's another well known film. A very well known film. She was also uh, Zira or Zira in Planet of the Apes. A number of. Uh, are you, are you a fan? Yeah. I'm not. I've never. I mean, I never really enjoyed the original Planet of the Apes. See, I thought I, didn't watch the new I ones. thought that would be your your type of type of movie. To be honest, Ian. It's not. No. No, it's not my thing. I enjoy them. I've not. I mean, it's not something I watched an awful lot of. But I, the original, uh, certainly, it was a a favourite when I was a bit younger. Yeah. I've never really been a fan. I don't like. I like any of Charlton Heston's movies. To be honest. Yeah. Well. <laughs> it's just personal, <laughs> well, yeah, personal, <laughs> personal taste. Yeah. Um, so we we then have a little confrontation after the will reading. If we get back to the story. Yes. Yeah, before that, there is a, a nice scene where Columbo uh, lights a cigar with a fairly, <laughs> yes. a fairly large lighter. It's not like one of these modern oh, it's little. Epic. Uh, it's huge. It takes two hands to it hold takes the two hands <laughs> and he pockets it <laughs> uh, and leaves the office. And the lawyer has to tell him to come yeah, back. He calls and, him back and takes it from him. Yeah. He's a bit, uh, a bit annoyed about that. Yeah. Uh, we get downstairs and Columbo is looking for Kingston. Yes, he runs. Down. And, but in fact, Kingston is also looking for Columbo. He's waiting there, yeah. Um, and I think we've got a clip here actually. Yeah, starts... let's listen to this because it's really good. You had this thing all figured out right from the start, haven't you? Dale Kingston hired someone to fake the theft and kill his uncle. Maybe even some poor little art student, perhaps. Mr. Kingston, I never said and that. And even I never... though I had an airtight alibi by total accident, at the time of my uncle's murder, that still didn't stop you, did it? Mr. Kingston, really, I well, have no idea. at this point, I'm sure that even a compulsively suspicious bureaucrat like you must have his doubts about my guilt. This scene typifies what's different about this particular episode. And what we mentioned earlier is that Columbo has got You've got got instincts. Yeah. He is suspicious, but he's not on the correct track as yet. There seems to be obstacles and hurdles in his way. He can't yeah. seem to get that definitive piece of proof or evidence. Uh, when he thinks he's getting close, something happens That's like it. this. Um, and I think again, you know, if, if I'm being honest, Colombo is trying to force his theory into. Or trying to force the evidence to fit his theory rather than taking it at face value. Yeah. And that but, works if you've got the right answer, but if he had got this completely wrong, then he's, he's wasting a bit of time and effort and so on. Yeah. So it, it does appear to be in a bit of a bind, and we leave the scene with him looking sort of confused, and I don't think he, he knows you know, what the next step is. Yeah. I'm sure, he'll, I'm sure he'll work his way out of it. Well, that's kind of what the show's based on so far. Yeah. We go to... Uh, the next scene. Yes, which, Columbo's doing some detective work. He's doing some real detective work here. He's speaking to the landlady of Tracy's flat, her Tracy, apartment. Yeah. Her apartment, and they're feeding a, a budgie. Yes, and it, she it seems bites. she's quite a character. She's a bit eccentric. A bit eccentric. Uh, nobody's full. Bit of a gossip. Uh, I think Columbo suggests that she probably doesn't know anything, but you know she's certainly not a. She's certainly not a busybody, but you know, if she if she perhaps saw something that might be helpful. Yeah. You can see that the actress is enjoying the role as well. It seems like kind of a fun character to, to get your teeth into. Yeah. She um so he asks if uh 
Tracy has been seen with any gentleman and, and perhaps an older gentleman yeah. specifically. Yeah. And fantastically, from I'd imagine from a, a police, uh, you know, a, a piece of detective work, she states that not only uh, can she confirm that she's been with an older man, she has in fact photograph of it. Yeah. Brilliant. That's what you want, isn't it? Yeah. That's exactly that. Like bingo. So they sit down and she pulls out her, her photo album. She starts going through her snaps with Columbo who looks increasingly impatient. And bored and impatient. Get to the point where we can show me this picture. And she, yeah. she, she does a bit of a, a Columbo. She talks about relatives and yeah. you know, a bit of background and that type of stuff. And he just wants to get to the, the picture in question. Yeah, the note I've got is Columbo is struggling to feign interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, he doesn't want to be rude though. He doesn't want to say to just get to it. Exactly. And, and again, this is quite an interesting scene because we assume that there's going to be a, a, a... Here's the moment. Here's the moment where he sort of gets him. But no, the picture she produces is of another gentleman. Yeah. Not again. So again, another stumbling block. Columbo is trying to force or trying to make this fit into his theory and he's presented with another piece of... Oh, yeah. He, he misses a piece of evidence. Yeah. So again, he's stumped. Yeah. And he go, we go, the next scene. Are we ready for the next scene? you happy with that? Well, just one thing. Um, yeah. The actress who played the landlady yeah was mary wicks now you probably don't recognize her but i do being a big uh, sort of murder mystery fan she played uh, marie the housekeeper in uh, the father dowling mysteries there you go so um she died in 1995 aged 85 um father dowling was produced by dean hargrove who was involved in um three Columbo episodes and he also done an awful lot of other murder mystery stuff through the go. through the eighties so he's well known to my, you know to to me Jake and the Fat Man and, and different things. Diagnosis murder I believe as well. So okay. That's a, a big guy in the, the murder and Matt in fact Matlock. 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 One yeah. of your favourites. One of my favourites. So where are we? Where do we go next? We go to it's a scene I, I thought was a bit weird. You've got a gardener and a policeman who we don't know having a conversation about gardening. Yeah, and it, it goes on a bit too long. I wasn't sure what garden this was at first. No, it wasn't clear. I thought it was perhaps back at the Matthews, Matthews house. Home, home, yeah, house. It wasn't clear. No, but um, in any event, as after they have their conversation, the policeman goes to leave and he gets shouted back at the garden, spotted a gun, a handgun. Yes, which turns out to be the handgun used in the, the, the killing. murder weapon. Yeah. We then enter Edna's home, and Columbo is talking to her. Get some good information from her. Yeah. Yeah. Clum was obviously interested in why um, Rudy decided to leave her, the art collection, when they've been yeah. divorced. And I think she tells him that they recently, as they've got older, uh, they've sort of mended some of their, um, you know, some of the issues they previously had, and they're back in sort of speaking terms, and perhaps yeah. even a sign of them rekindling some sort of relationship. Yeah, I think there seems to be a thawing of any animosity. But more importantly... Uh, she tells Columbo that she received the collection not to keep, not to sell, but to give away. Well, that suggests then that she isn't surprised to have received it. Exactly. That's a, 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 something we're not, we're not, you know, did, was that perhaps missing from the will reading? Maybe, maybe they didn't have this fully thought through, but she did look very shocked at the will reading, but now... She gives the impression that she, she knew. knew. But unless she maybe she had the idea but didn't know he'd gone ahead and done it. Yeah. Perhaps yeah, perhaps they just had discussed it. Yeah. She knew what his thoughts were. And yeah, but it's not it's not very clear. No. Okay. So yeah, she has to take the collection and give it to you know public you know, schools and hospitals. Distribute and it for dish, yeah. yeah. Do some good. To make you know, so, so that yeah, the public can benefit, not just some sort of greedy art collector. Yeah. To, to store in a house somewhere for his own benefit. Yeah. Kingston then um, arrives at the, the door. Yes. And Colombo tells him that they found a gun nearby that matches the one missing from his uncle's desk through the murder we weapon. Yeah. And we start to see his sort of facade slip here because he's getting frustrated. Like uh, Franklin in the first episode, like Brimmer in the second episode, yeah. that his narrative isn't being accepted. Mm -hmm. And it's upsetting him. Yeah, and uh, Columbo, he goes to call ballistics apparently down at the office. Yeah. This is a, obviously a, a fake phone call. He already will, will be aware that ballistics has confirmed because I think he's quite forceful on the phone. Uh, 
and he tells the guy to hurry up and give him the results. I'm sure he has those results yeah. from ballistics already. But he confirms that this is the murder weapon. Yeah. Um, at this point, Kingston sort of starts to put his plan into action because he tells Edna to keep quiet as she may be a suspect. So the garden's office, we find out that the garden where the gun was found is just behind her home. Yeah. Um, so Kingston tells her to yeah to keep quiet. She may be a suspect. Yeah. Uh, and Columbo immediately dismisses this suggestion offhand. Yeah, he's not interested. And he, it's interesting because uh, Kingston has got to... <laughs> Is obviously deeply annoyed at this dismissal, yeah. But has to pretend that he's happy with it. Yes, so it's quite an uh, it's, it's an, odd, an odd act to juggle, and uh, I found it uh, you know I found it enjoyable to watch how how he portrayed this. Yeah, no, he got, he got it okay though. It was good, yeah, yeah. Um, and in fact, he dismisses it so much that he suggests that Edna go shopping as she had she planned plan, to do. Yeah. Uh, this really annoys Kingston. Yeah, he wants to search the house. Yeah. So we're, we're outside Edna's house now. Um, Columbo gets shouted over to the bins. Yes. Or trash cans. Um, well, Kingston, again, is unhappy that, that, that he's not following these clues. And he, well, what he does first before they find the gun is that he implies that uh, Edna should be a suspect and pretends that he thinks that Columbo may be trying to lure her into a false sense of security. Yes. Again, he's not happy <laughs> that Edna has not been suspected. Yeah, here. no, he's getting frustrated. And then, as you say, another cop finds uh, the, the 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 brown paper wrapping in the the trash can. Yeah, and again, Columbo's not impressed. No, he wouldn't be. Columbo is far too smart to believe that um, even the most incapable of murderers is going to toss away a handgun just outside your home and shove this wrapping paper into your own, the, in your own yeah. trash can. You know, you'd have to be a complete fool to to believe that and not see it for what it is. And I think that Kingston, yeah, this is where he's, his, the initial murder was quite well thought out. Yeah, but he's starting The faming yeah. uh, of Edna is poor. This is actually the first moment in the episode this wrapping paper being discovered where it occurred to me, oh, he's trying to frame her. Yes. Uh, well, uh, although it's implied by the title of the episode, I wasn't really thinking yeah. about that as I watched it. And there was no, it, it wasn't something that was pressed on us from the start or from the middle part. This is really just here in Act 3, or at the start of Act 3 of the episode. Yeah. Essentially, that the, the framing attempt is coming clearer, coming into focus a wee bit. Yeah. And Columbo says that he, does, he uses the uh, his previous accusation and rebuttal by uh, Kingston as a means of um, supporting how he treats Edna he says he doesn't want to jump to any conclusions like he did with Kingston yeah and he's going to sit on everything until the paintings show up to, yeah he starts to tie Kingston in knots here because he yeah. knows what he's trying to do and there's no way Kingston can argue can, seem, can be seen to be arguing against what he's claiming to, to feel and believe yeah. um, but Kingston tries to force what he says is he wants Columbo to search the, to the home clear her. To, put, yeah, to, to put their mind at ease to prove that the paintings aren't there and again this yeah. seems very very again very heavy handed yep. he's, he's laying on th far too thick here I think yes uh, and he's clearly unhappy that Columbo won't go along with it Columbo says no I'm not searching I don't believe she's guilty I'm not going to bother and we then see Kingston at the lawyer's office yep. who is explaining the situation and saying listen for, for Edna's benefit I think we should insist that her house is searched yeah and the lawyer agrees. He says he's got people in, you know, high city hall, he city says. hall, and he can over overrule Colombo, yeah. and make sure this does happen. Yeah, and then the lawyer expresses suspicion about Edna, and he gets shot down by Dale. Yeah, well, he has to maintain that. Yeah, because the lawyer opened the scene saying that there's no way Edna would hurt anybody. Yeah. And then by the end of the scene, he's saying, "Oh, what well, she did it." Mm. We then see a car park where. Um, Edna has been shopping. Yeah. She's left some shopping, old fashioned shopping boxes in the back of the car. Yeah. Uh, you don't see those, you know, these days, shopping boxes too many, you know, they're fairly rare. Not very often, no. No. Um, and we, it is implied that he takes, well, he takes the, uh, the paintings, the drawings. Yeah. From his car. Yeah. Puts them in one of her shopping boxes. And puts them in one of her shopping boxes. 
we then return to Edna's house where the lawyer, Kingston and Edna all return together. Well, this is the big um, start of the final scene, essentially. It is. So the drawings are in the the, 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 the shopping b- boxes. Box, yeah. They enter the house and they're having a drink. Kingston del- deliberately spills a drink uh, on himself in yeah. order that he can move to go into another room. It gives him an opportunity to go and hide the paint. Does. So he retrieves the paintings from the boxes and he hides them in a, a linen closet. closet yeah. Okay. We then see the, the uniformed or the search team arrive. Yeah, Columbo's not with them. Columbo's not. Columbo arrives a, a few moments later. And he has his hands in his in his pockets. We notice that. I mean, that's we notice that straight away. Yeah, when you see him driving up, this is he, you see him in his wee car. Yeah, come up, um, and then he comes in. Well, it, before he comes in, he's denied the uh, entry by the uniformed cop at the door, who again doesn't recognise him as a as a cop immediately because I don't of his know if appearance. This is true or not? Because I got the feeling later on that Columbo set this whole thing up. Yeah, he would have set it up, but perhaps the person stationed in the door wouldn't have maybe been privy not. to yeah, that. Maybe not. Yeah. He's just a, a general sort of dog's body. Yeah. Um, he enters the house and he tells Kingston that he is surprised that he had not been informed of the search. Yeah. And Kingston is quite dismissive. He suggests that in that case, then perhaps he isn't needed, and he go should, for his dinner. He should go home and have his dinner. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Um, that, was good. that, that response. Um, Columbo says, "I think he'll he'll decide to stay." Well, Columbo says that now that he's here, uh, the folk upstairs wouldn't be happy if he left. Yeah. And Edna tells Columbo that Kingston and the lawyer have advised uh, that she should have the search. Yeah, she doesn't seem very happy about it. No, uh, because she says, I thought you you know, you believed that I wasn't involved and I'm not guilty. And Columbo says, that, yeah. you know, it wasn't my decision, I, I don't think you are. Yeah, and then the pictures show up and this is where you get the reveal by the captain that Columbo's in charge of the investigation. Yeah, well, so the search team arrive in the living room with the paintings that they have, that they have found. Yeah. Uh, and Kingston feigns disgust and disbelief at, at Edna. Puts on this big act of how he's really disappointed that she yeah. obviously is guilty of, of the, all the acts, associated acts. Uh, and Edna protests her innocence. Yeah. Um, and the lawyer asks the captain or, or whoever it is there, the senior officer, not Colombo, uh, if he will be arresting her. And at this point, as you say... Yeah, the captain reveals this is Columbo's investigation and he's in charge and he has been all along. And Kingston says, hey, but I, I, I thought... And they stop him and say, yeah, we know what you thought. Yeah. Uh, so they put him in his place. That's it. So Columbo starts to kind of point the finger at him a little bit. Yeah, and he asks if he can... Kingston asks if he can prove it. He looks at the, uh, the fingerprint expert who nods and Columbo says, yep, I think we can. And Kingston asks how... And he tells him that uh, they're going to do it by fin- fingerprints. Yeah, and, and Kingston's not impressed with that. He thinks no. he's got this. Well, he coming. leaps to the obvious, con- you know, assumption that they're, they're looking for his fingerprints, and he says, "Ah, my, I, my fingerprints are all over this. That doesn't prove anything." Yeah. And Columbo says, well, "I'm not looking for your fingerprints. I'm looking for my fingerprints." Yes, he explains to him that the bag with the paintings in it that night at the apartment. Back, yep, when he told them that there was watercolours in there when he yeah. arrived at his home. Um, and Columbo made a grab. Yes. He now, Columbo the... can't have been setting this up. This is just chance. And a, a good cop uses chance to his uh, benefit when yep, he can. his advantage, yeah. Um, so he had said that, yeah, he had touched those paintings and that the only way that he could have got his fingers on the paintings that were apparently stolen as if, it, if those were the ones which he had in that bag that night. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I think Kingston... He kind of knows the game. He though. knows and he panics. Yeah, he, yeah. Let, let's have a listen to him. Uh, this is entrapment. It's a setup. that's all. You, you, you touched those paintings just now while I wasn't looking. You saw him do it, didn't you? You put your prints on those paintings while you were bent over watching them when they were working on it. He touched them. You touched... You... And at that point, fantastically, Columbo removes his hands from his pockets to show... He's wearing gloves. Wearing gloves. Yeah, and it's a brilliant finish finally. and it freezes on that, that, that final frame. That's a superb finish. I love it. I think it's one of my favourite endings because it's all done through... 
the, 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 the removal of the hands, that one reveal says it all, sums everything up. Doesn't have to say a word. Nothing at all. Yeah, so I think we got us we got back to what we saw more in the first two episodes with the focus on the killer rather than on the witness that we saw in um, last week's episode. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it is more focused. That is, that, that is the, the, the point. Yeah, and I think it works well for that. I think it was a good... It wasn't quite on the, the level that we saw in the first week when you had the sparring with Colombo mm-hmm. and the killer. But there was the same sort of idea. You had a few of the head-to-heads. You had a lot of scenes with the two of them together. And I think that this was a good episode. I think it's a very strong episode. I like the, I like the start that there wasn't a lot of explanation as to who they, you know, the, the characters were, the yep. motive. We got right into the story. I think it sort of grabbed you straight away immediately. Well, that was a different approach. I mean, we talked about that right at the start of the show. Um, how they they didn't do the backstory. Yep. They didn't tell us who anybody was. Um, for me, I preferred the ones where we got that bit of backstory, but okay. this one still worked. Yeah, I mean, you don't always have to do things exactly the same. It would get formulaic at that point, so I don't mind them mixing it up a little bit in that way. Worthwhile mentioning the the director, a chap called I Averback. Yep. Um, he has been the director of two Columbo episodes. Okay. This and uh, a Stitch in Crime from season two, which we will be getting to fairly early, early in the year. Yeah. He also directed Mash, The Rockford Files, and. Uh, an episode of Murder, She Wrote. Well, they're all fairly high-profile shows. Yeah. Um, Jackson Gillis was the writer, and he has been involved in 11 episodes of Columbo. Well, that's a this lifer. Is his, this is his first, so yeah. He also liked uh, his style here. Yeah. Uh, he also was a writer for Perry Mason, Murder, She Wrote also, yep. Lost in Space, Ironside, different things. All the classics. Yeah. So, again, a strong team, strong cast, strong story. Yep, um, more Oscar winners. Oscar winners. What you'd expect from a Columbo episode, actually? Well, from what I've seen so far, anyway, yeah. What are we going to be looking at next week? I don't know why I'm asking you. Well, uh, the fifth episode is, as the far as I can tell you, I don't know anything. Uh, it will be Lady in Waiting. Lady in Waiting. With a guest star who you will most certainly recognise. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. But perhaps not in a the, uh, the, the role typical to you know, what you've come to know. Okay, well, I'll look forward to that. Hopefully we'll pick it up. Yeah, uh, again, thanks to everyone for for taking the time to download and, and, and listen to us. We really uh, really do appreciate it. It's, yep. it's fantastic. Great to get the feedback. Keep talking to us on Twitter at Columbo Podcast, on the website columbopodcast.com. If you listen to us through iTunes or through another podcast app, please do leave ratings and reviews if you enjoy the show because that helps us get the, the word out to more people to yeah, get the great. podcast promoted and that would be great and, and thank you to everyone who's taken the time to do that already yep thanks again okay Ian I shall see you next week for Lady in Week. see you then you have been listening to the Colombo podcast from Heard Yet Media